Good afternoon. I call to order the second plenary meeting of the international meeting entitled Stockholm Plus 50, A Healthy Planet for the Prosperity of All, Our Responsibility, Our Opportunity. This afternoon, the international meeting will continue its consideration of Agenda Item 7, General Debate. The meeting will continue hearing statements in the general debate. We will have a long list of speakers, and I wish to remind speakers of the time limit of three minutes for national statements and five minutes for statements delivered on behalf of groups. Speakers with longer statements are encouraged to read a shorter version of their text and to submit the full length of their statements to the Secretariat for posting on the meeting website. To assist speakers in managing their time, a, a timer is being projected on the screen. In case speakers exceed their time limit by one minute, the microphone will automatically be deactivated. I apologize in advance if speakers are cut off. This measure is being taken to ensure that all speakers can deliver their statements in the limited time available for general debate. As outlined in a letter dated 29 April 2022, addressed by the permanent representatives of Kenya and Sweden to the United Nations in New York, to the President of the General Assembly, the pre-recorded video statements received from speakers other than heads of state and government will be published on the Stockholm Plus 50 website, and the content of the statements will be drawn upon in the preparation of the summary of the meeting. I would like to acknowledge the pre-recorded video statements received from Bahrain, Belarus, Chile, Holy See, Iceland, Ireland, Kuwait, Luxembourg, Micronesia, Panama, Serbia, and Thailand. We will now hear statements in the general debate. I now give the floor to Her Excellency Miriam Bint Mohammed Al Mahiri, Minister of Climate Change and Environment of the United Arab Emirates. Excellencies, colleagues, thank you first to Sweden and Kenya for convening this event to highlight our responsibility and opportunity to leave a healthy planet to the next generations. In this decade of action, the UAE is committed to international partnership for low carbon, circular, nature positive, and resilient growth, particularly as we grapple with the simultaneous impacts of climate, COVID and conflict. We are also committed to putting the outcomes of Stockholm plus 50 at the heart of our COP28 presidency and driving a response to the planetary crisis that cuts across the international system. We, the UAE, are currently working on updating our NDCs with more ambitious goals. We're also currently working on a detailed roadmap for our net zero by 2050 strategic initiative. We, ladies and gentlemen, need action. So I would like to highlight four areas of action we see as particularly urgent and promising. First, we need to frame net zero not just as an environmental requirement, but as the great economic opportunity of our era. There is now a menu of options from ultra low cost renewable energy to resource efficient agriculture, mangrove restoration and air quality laws. So as a global community, we can collectively help countries to identify the options that deliver growth, jobs and health benefits unique to their circumstances. It is essential to build public-private partnerships and leverage the private sector so next year's response to the global stock take under the Paris Agreement will be an exceptional platform to capture this potential return on investment sector by sector. Second, we must enshrine the 30 by 30 biodiversity goal at the CBD later this year, and financing it should be our simultaneous focus in additional international fora. Quality control of the voluntary carbon offset market 
greater use of debt for nature swaps, easier access to climate finance for local communities, and biodiversity risk disclosures are among the package of solutions we would like to see no later than 2025. Third, we need to bring political visibility to fragile communities. Climate change and environmental degradation are creating enormous costs from destabilization, displacement, and conflict. Yet highly fragile communities receive just $2 per capita of climate finance. A program of water, food, and nature investments in these countries would be one of the most strategic actions we could take for the SDGs. Fourth, we need to do more on fixing our food systems. It is essential to transform them into more resilient, equitable, and sustainable ones. We can use proven tools such as adopting technologies, partnerships, uh, ensuring access to finance, and ensuring all segments of the food supply chain are included. Let's all ensure that food systems transformation actions are included in our NDCs. Thank you. I thank the Minister of Climate Change and Environment of the United Arab Emirates for her statement. I now give the floor to His Excellency Erki Savisar, Minister of the Environment of Estonia. Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Firstly, I would like to thank uh, the host country, Sweden, as well as Kenya, for uh, their leadership. Secondly, Estonia is honored uh, to be here in position of uh, vice uh, president of uh, such an important international meeting. We all know that uh, in what difficult situation the whole world is uh, today. We have been hit by a real cascade of uh, crisis in recent years starting with uh, much longer than expected uh, coronavirus pandemic, which was uh, added by energy crisis. Today, uh, the security situation has changed dramatically across uh, the Europe. We condemn Russia's uh, unprovoked and uh, unjustified act of uh, aggression against Ukraine. All of uh, this has a significant impact on uh, the environment as well as uh, on own activities. However, despite the crisis, we can't put aside our daily uh, responsibilities, including environmental protection. On contrary, I believe the key to resolving the crisis lies in a green transition. In this regard, we totally support the European Union's Green Deal strategy that will lead Europe into a climate neutral, clean and resource efficient economy. Let me shortly explain what has been done in Estonia in the field of green transition. We have adopted Estonia's climate policy, and I can say that the heat has so far met its main goal. Estonia's total emissions have decreased by 35 percent compared to 2017. Compared to 1990, we have reduced greenhouse gas emissions by 71 percent. Also, it is uh, important to find a balance between biodiversity conservation and environmental use. The society is increasingly aware that biodiversity loss has a devastating impact on nature, human health and economy. Protecting biodiversity is not just an environmental issue. Even Einstein, a great naturalist and physicist, once said that if a beast disappear, humanity will have only four years to live. Estonia is at the forefront of uh, developing digital solutions in the world, but this does not mean that uh, we can't can rest on laurels. We are planning significant investments in the coming years to ensure that underlying uh, data set for green transition and other environmental data are available as open data. 
Here the value of global cooperation cannot be underestimated. Estonia is uh, in cooperation with uh, the UNEP launched Data for Environment, Alliance or Deal for short. The deal has a collaboration platform will help uh, to shape global environmental uh, data policy and work to ensure the environmental data is uh, high quality and accessible. We are uh, inviting everyone to join to collaborate with uh, this uh, alliance. It is uh, uh, very important to bear in mind that the green transition is human-centered. Only together we can provide our children and grandchildren the future they deserve. Let me end with the words of Mother Teresa. I can do things you can't. You can do things I can't. But together we can do great things. Thank you. I thank the Minister of Estonia for his statement. I now give the floor to His Excellency Espen Bart Eide, Minister of Climate and Environment of Norway. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, let me also start by uh, saluting the governments of Sweden and Kenya and the United Nations for bringing us together. I think it's a, a very good idea to reflect on uh, the last uh, 50 years, both of uh, what we have learned, what we have achieved, and of course, what we did not achieve and what we yet have to do. Because, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we know that we are living at a watershed moment. We have only very few years to really turn the tide. If we don't do something seriously but with the direction of travel, both on emissions and on biodiversity loss by mid-decade, we are in serious deep trouble. Time is up for incremental change, for small adaptation. What we now need to do is systemic, strategic, transformational change of practically everything, all aspects of our life, of industry, of transport, of agriculture, of how we build our houses uh, and how we produce our things. It's possible, it's called deep decarbonization, but it has to start right now and we have to do it, all of us, at home and together. We also need to think about uh, having a just transition. If uh, the transition is not just, there will just be no transition. Uh, and that does not mean that we should slow, slow down the transition. Quite on the contrary, we need to do, make it a faster transition. But just means we have to think about the distributional aspects of change because change creates winners and losers, and we need to deal with that. And, we, and just transition is not only about justice today, it's also justice towards the future, towards the young generation, towards those coming after us. We have to pre prepare a world in which it is possible to make the choices they want to make. The time to act is now on biodiversity loss, on uh, putting real value to our uh, uh, natural economy, to take much better care of our forests, our pitlands, our, uh, uh, our oceans, the mother of all ecosystems, and really to follow up on the major achievements from uh, UNEA, where we all gathered only three months ago, on the Plastics Treaty, and all the other achievements from there. These are words they need to be transformed into action. Because after all, friends, the real value of meetings like these lies not in the eloquence of our words, but in the measurable impact of our deeds. And if the difference between our deeds and our words is too strong, I'm afraid that uh, young people will lose the faith both in democratic systems and in multilateral uh, assemblies like these. So we really need to speak, but also do, and we really need to make sure that we put our money where our mouth is and that we actually deliver on every single of those promises that we will be making these very days. Thank you for the attention. I thank the Minister of Climate and Environment of Norway for his statement. I now give the floor to His Excellency Joaquim Alvaro Piera Leite, Minister of Environment of Brazil. Hello, hello, testing the English.
channel. This is the English channel for Relay. One, two, three, testing the English channel. Hello, hello, testing the English channel. One, two, three, testing the English channel. Ladies and gentlemen, ministers, heads of delegation, it gives me great pleasure to take part in this conference as we celebrate the 50th anniversary since the Stockholm original conference. Congratulations to the governments of Kenya and Sweden for this event. 50 years ago, the environmental concerns were brought to the center of the world's agenda. The Brazilian government is greatly concerned about the ongoing conflict in Ukraine and its consequences. In a balanced approach, we defend an immediate ceasefire to the war and the protection of the civilian population and a compromise solution negotiated through diplomatic channels. It also makes us fearful given the increased emissions in countries of Europe and in the US, a move in the opposite direction of the agreed upon climate goals. The consequences and negative impacts on energy security, food security, and the poverty rates imposed by the pandemic and by the conflict in Ukraine were particularly felt in a perverse manner in developing countries and their most vulnerable populations. The commitments agreed upon along the past few decades in terms of means of implementation have not been fully fulfilled. Developing countries, including those in Africa, still face scarce funding and inefficient deployment of the solutions. Brazil, of course, also has environmental problems, just as is the case of the more or the majority of the 190 countries signatory to the climate agreements. Illegal deforestation in the Amazon region, 100 million Brazilians with no access to sewage treatment, and 35 million Brazilians with no access to drinking water. An extremely low recycling rate of 3% and more than 2,700 open air dump sites. To protect forests, the federal government has strengthened efforts to fight illegal deforestation with more environmental agents out on the ground. And back in March 2022, we launched the Guardians of the Amazon Biome program, which is aimed at fighting organized crime with stationary. Already we have six stationary bases in priority municipalities with unprecedented coordination between the Ministry of Justice, the Federal Police, the Federal Highway Police, the National Force, the Saint-Cipan Center, the Environmental Protection Institute, and the Biodiversity Institute. Brazil intends to be a high-profile player in the global solutions to fight climate change by speeding up policies to reduce carbon emissions, methane, and plastic pollutions, and also promote sanitation and waste treatment, low carbon agriculture and renewable sources of energy and the green hydrogen projects. Regarding carbon, the federal government established the newly regulated domestic carbon market with innovative and progressive features such as the new concept of methane credits, the possibility of documented the carbon footprint from different products and activities as well as native vegetation, soil or carbon in the soil, as well as the blue carbon found in our vast marine and river areas. Regarding methane, we were the first country in the world to adopt concrete measures by means of our zero methane emissions reduction program, exempting federal taxes, relieving Texas with tailored credit lines, focusing solely on organic waste and the, with the potential to reduce emissions by 30%. We, through our sanitation framework, we have already ensured freedom of competition and have attracted 10 billion US dollars in contracted investments in line with the goal of providing universal provision of sewage water treatment services to all Brazilians. The waste treatment framework has allowed legal certainty and novel projects for recycling, which will take place in a speedier manner. The zero dump site program since 2019 has shut down 20% of the open air dump sites. And the Recycle Plus program has created the innovative recycling programs, measures that have certainly contributed to lower plastics pollution. I now give the floor to His Excellency. I now give the floor to His Excellency D. Maxwell Sa Kemaya, Minister for Foreign Affairs of Liberia. Okay. Excellencies, 
five decades after the Stockholm Conference, we are back as a committee of nations to deliberate on what we have done to save the planet Earth from our ambitious, greed, and selfish desires at some times to develop at the detriment of the environment and our own existence. Five decades after, Liberia acknowledges the tremendous anyway. made at the global level in promoting various economies and empowering the well-being of people from the lower ladder of development through the developing national policies and enacting laws for prosperity and development. Despite the gains the global community has made five decades ago, the science of climate change informs that time is not on our side. If we do not move faster to protect the Earth from global rise in temperature, we stand at risk of losing those gains we have made. The upcoming climate change conference, COP27 in Egypt, must be a COP of action that will provide a comprehensive framework in the implementation of the Paris Agreement. Liberia welcomes the decision made at the just ended UN conference on desertification COP15 in Abidjan, Cote d'Ivoire, on the issue of addressing the land degradation and, and restoring ecosystem services, and also applaud the hosting of UN Forest Forum 17 in New York, USA. We are meeting at a time the world is gradually returning to normalcy due to COVID-19, but again also threatened with the Russia and Ukraine war which has enormous global consequences on human lives and the environment. This war must stop now in order to save humanity and protect the environment. The theme for this important conference underscores the importance of recommitting our governments and peoples to protecting our environment and accelerate actions in the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals for the present and future generations. Accelerating actions for the attainment of sustainable development will require leaving no one behind. It must be an inclusive, transparent, and participatory process, taking into consideration all the environmental challenges that continue to impede our national development at the expense of the environment. Accelerating actions means we must work together in harmony and set, realign, and recalibrate global and national agendas, teams, visions, missions, goals, policies, programs, and many other initiatives to strike the balance between the environment, development, and sustainable livelihood. More so, accelerating action means deploying the human and financial capitals, which I think are two key important elements that are necessary imperative in the fulfillment of our responsibility and seeking the opportunity to achieve a healthy planet for the prosperity of all. We need to do more at the global and national levels and need to do so now. In Liberia, we started this accelerated action at a low level, probably due to the fact that our environment was not fully challenged at the time due to low population pressure on the environment and on our exploration and extraction of our enormous natural resources with very low environmental impacts also at that time. Today, yes, we are challenged from the north, south, east, and west of our country, Liberia. I, th I thank the Minister for Foreign Affairs of Liberia for his statement. Thank you. I now give the floor to Her Excellency Isabel Barrow Amade, Minister for Foreign Affairs and Cooperation of Monaco. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, 
The United Nations Conference on the Human Environment has opened a new era of global cooperation on environmental issues. It promoted the birth of the very concept of sustainable development and led to the creation of the United Nations Environment Program, which we celebrated last March. Fifty years on, the Principality of Monaco wishes to reaffirm its commitment to the still relevant principles of the 1972 Declaration which have inspired our national policies and guide our international cooperation actions. This legacy should fuel our common yearning to seek solutions that reconcile economic development with environmental management, as well as the need for global cooperation. For more than a century, scientific knowledge of the seas and oceans and their preservation have lain at the very heart of Monaco's concerns. It is with a special attention to our sea, the Mediterranean Sea, that we support the strengthening of environmental law and multilateralism, especially in the fields of the fight against coastal pollution and the preservation of marine habitats and species. This is why the Principality especially supports the upcoming drafting of a new binding legal instrument to combat plastic pollution. My country will also continue to work towards the development of an international legally binding instrument within the framework of the United Nations Conventions on the Law of the Sea of a legally binding instrument on the conservation and sustainable use of marine biodiversity beyond areas of national jurisdiction. Now, with regard to operational management tools, Monaco is convinced that marine protected areas are a sustainable and responsible solution to counter biodiversity loss, mitigate global warming, and achieve sustainable use of resources. For this reason, we support the establishment of a target to protect 30% of the planet by 2030, and that, of course, includes the oceans. Monaco would also like to welcome the recent decision of the United Nations Environmental Assembly to set up a group of experts for the sound management of chemical and chemicals and waste and for pollution prevention. More broadly speaking, the cooperation engaged in by the Principality in the fields of health, education and food security has promoted resilience of beneficiary populations against the effects of climate change. In the future, the implementation of nature-based solutions should enable us to meet our complementary commitments in the fight against climate change and biodiversity loss. Now, back in 1972, we witnessed the expression of the will to develop a common understanding of the means to ensure the preservation and improvement of what was then called the human environment. So as a result of better coordination of multilateral agreements on the environment, especially under the aegis of the United Nations and its programs and institutions, we can enrich and we can build on the momentum of the Stockholm Declaration of 50 years ago and meet the global challenges to the survival and the prosperity of future generations. I thank you. I thank the Minister of Foreign Affairs and Cooperation of Monaco for her statement. I now give the floor to His Excellency Abdul Momen, Minister for Foreign Affairs of Bangladesh. Honorable Presidents, distinguished delegates, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. The interconnectivity between environment, development and poverty, or people's welfare, that was first recognized in the Stockholm Declaration in 1972 are more prominent now. We can now feel that the global warming is happening every moment, mostly by human activities. This is unfortunate yet true. COVID-19 pandemic has worsened the situation. Ahead of COP27, the Stockholm 50 platform has offered a unique opportunity to rethink the critical role of the global community for this resilient, healthy, and prosperous planet for all. The latest IPCC report and the outcome of COP26 reflect this urgency urgency to act, not talk. Excellencies, due to climate change, the developing countries risk severe weather events, food and water scarcity displacement, loss of lands and poverty, among other challenges. 
their efforts to attain the 2030 agenda of sustainable development are seriously threatened. In Bangladesh, lives and livelihoods of millions of people are at risk. It is estimated that due to sea level rise, about 12 to 18 percent of the coastal area will be submerged, and nearly 40 million people could become homeless and jobless, leading to poverty. We already have more than 6.5 million displaced population because of river erosion and erratic climatic changes. This could be a global security issue unless we take corrective, corrective actions now. And our growth rate is expected to reduce by 2 to, two to 9 percent due to climate changes. Therefore, our national parliament has adopted planetary emergency resolution with consensus to save this planet Earth. We urge other nations to do the same. Mr. President, to shift Bangladesh's trajectory from vulnerability to resilience to prosperity, we have developed our own Mujib Climate Prosperity Plan. As the recent past chair of the Climate Vulnerable Forum, we are ready to assist other members of the forum to develop their own prosperity plans. All said and done, developing countries need effective financial mechanism and technology for climate actions. The industrialized nations should play their historical responsibility to limit the global temperature at 1.5 degrees Celsius. They must fulfill their unmet promise to disperse $100 billion a year and provide technological support. New and adequate finance is required to address loss and damage. The plight of climate migrants must be placed at the center of climate change discourses and development partners must share the burden of the rehabilitation. Due to COVID-19 pandemic and now due to ongoing war, people of many countries are bleeding. Poverty is sharply increasing. Survival has become a challenge and people are afraid that funds should be deviated, deviated from climate change to build up innovative weapons leading to future of our children into more uncertainty, vulnerability, insecurity and helplessness. I thank you. Joy Bangla. Joy Bangabandhu. I thank the Minister for Foreign Affairs of Bangladesh for his statement. I now give the floor to Her Excellency Amy Kaur, Senior Minister of State for Sustainability and the Environment of Singapore. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, 50 years ago, the 1972 United Nations Conference on the Human Environment adopted the Stockholm Declaration, which reshaped global governance on the environment. Stockholm Plus 50 is an opportune moment for us to take stock of the challenges and opportunities facing our planet and strengthen our resolve to protect it for the prosperity of all. First, as we emerge from the COVID-19 pandemic, we must stay committed to the sustainability agenda. 50 years ago, Singapore became one of the first countries to form a ministry dedicated to the environment. Today, sustainability remains at the heart of everything we do. In 2021, we launched the Singapore Green Plan 2030 as a whole of nation movement to advance Singapore's national agenda on sustainable development. It charts bold and concrete sectoral initiatives and targets in this critical decade, strengthening our efforts to implement the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and the Paris Agreement. In February this year, Singapore also announced that we will raise our ambition to achieve net zero emission by or around mid-century in line with the Glasgow Climate Pact. We will also raise our carbon tax progressively as an enabler to raise our ambition in this critical decade. Second, the world must shift from a linear resource use model to a circular one, invest in research and innovation to overcome our natural constraints and make the best use of our precious planetary resources. As a resource-scarce country, Singapore is investing heavily in sustainable infrastructure 
such as our upcoming integrated waste management facility. To close our resource loop, circular approaches also will be crucial in tackling global challenges such as plastic pollution. Finally, we must continue to enhance partnerships to strengthen our global environment and climate action. Multilateral environment agenda continue to provide a good platform to advance our collective response to the global sustainability challenges we face. The Paris Agreement, which was adopted by 196 parties in Paris in 2015, reflects our collective commitment to address climate change. At COP26, Singapore also joined several sectoral initiatives, such as the Agriculture Innovation Mission for Climate and the Glasgow Leaders Declaration on Forest and Land Use. We need to faithfully implement our commitments and accelerate our transition to a low-carbon future. Thank you. I thank the Senior Minister of State for Sustainability and the Environment of Singapore for her statement. I now give the floor to His Excellency Hale Pierre, Minister of Environment Protection of Nature and Sustainable Development of Cameroon. You want to? Like this? Excellence. Excellencies, Madam Prime Minister of Sweden, Excellencies, Mr. President of the Republic of Kenya, ladies and gentlemen, heads of delegations. I should like to start by conveying my gratitude to and the gratitude of the President of the Republic, Paul Bia, to the Secretary General of the United Nations for the invitation. And I'd like to do the same to the people and government of Sweden and thank them for their welcome. They're welcome and hosting us so we can participate in this important international meeting. Now, we align ourselves with the declarations and the statements made by Pakistan on behalf of the G77 and China and that of Morocco on behalf of the African group. And in doing this, we would like to add the following. Cameroon, since 1972, has participated actively in the various negotiations which led to the adoption of uh, multilateral conventions and agreements on the environment. Following the Earth Summit in Rio, as part of an inclusive process, my country improved its legislative framework in the field of the protection of the environment with, amongst others, the creation of a ministry responsible for the environment and sustainable development. Along these same lines, in 2016, we set up a system for managing waste, and this uh, is aimed at boosting the circular economy, aware as we are of our commitments at an international level and the unavoidable nature of the multifaceted challenges we are facing, and especially the triple crisis, that of climate, biodiversity loss, and pollution, Cameroon ratified a great many conventions and multilateral agreements, including the conventions of Rio and their various protocols. The Paris Agreement, the Convention on uh, Chemical Substances and Waste, such as the Stockholm Convention on Persistent Organic Pollutants. As a result of the implementation of all of these legal tools, Cameroon has achieved palpable results in terms of the protection of human health, the environment, and sustainable development. Distinguished guests. As we move to achieve the objectives we have set ourselves since 1972, let us seize the opportunity afforded to us by this meeting to pool our efforts to ensure that we save all of humankind. To this end, Cameroon would recommend that we effectively implement, without any further delay, the principle of polluter pays. And we urge our partners and stakeholders to abide by commitments uh, 
subscribed within the framework of the financing for the environment, especially in the fields of the protection of the environment. There is a need here to recall that all of us must abide by the principles of shared common but shared responsibilities, differentiated responsibilities. My delegation here would like to underscore the urgent nature of the need to improve sources of financing and uh, facilitate access to climate financing uh, as well as the Global Fund uh, to help us uh, to meet the real challenges I thank the Minister of Environment, Protection of Nature, and Sustainable Development of Cameroon for his statement. I now give the floor to His Excellency Konstantinos Kadis, Minister of Agriculture, Rural Development and Environment of Cyprus. Thank you. Excellencies, distinguished guests, it is my honor to deliver this statement on behalf of the Government of the Republic of Cyprus at this milestone meeting for UNEP. This year, we celebrate UNEP's 50th anniversary. Foremost, I would like to express our appreciation to the organization for its commitment and dedication for promoting an environmental sustainability around the world. Dear friends, the pace of progress within the environmental dimension of the Sustainable Development Agenda is unfortunately not at the desired levels making it difficult to meet the environmental emergencies we are currently facing. We need to accelerate our efforts. We need to build on our previous achievements. The Paris Agreement, the post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework, and the Global Agreements for Eliminating Pollution in order to effectively fight the triple planetary crisis. Strengthening sustainable development becomes even more important in these trying times due to the continued aggressive actions by the Russian Federation against Ukraine and its people, which have immediate and long-term effects on human lives, human health, food security, and the environment. Distinguished guests, as we enter the post-pandemic era, it is time to act together for delivering on our commitments let out in the 2030 Agenda. As the motto of this meeting indicates, today we have the opportunity and the responsibility to utilize the numerous tools we have available for intensifying our efforts towards achieving sustainable development and delivering a healthy planet for the prosperity of all. The Republic of Cyprus is fully committed to the 2030 Agenda. Indicatively, as a member of the European Union, Cyprus has adopted the ambitious European goal for climate neutrality by 2050. Moreover, more than 30 per cent of the country's territory is already protected, focusing on the conservation of the unique biodiversity of our island. We are also working towards reducing pollution by adapting the principle of the circular economy. However, we definitely can do more. Dear friends, at this remarkable meeting, we express our full support to the, organi to the organizers and we commit to continue, wo continue working together with other states and stakeholders on the environmental dimension of sustainable development. Thank you for your attention. 
I thank the Minister of Agriculture, Rural Development and Environment of Cyprus for his statement. I now give the floor to His Excellency Stephen Guibault, Minister of Environment and Climate Change of Canada. President, Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I am pleased to joining you here today in Stockholm. I would like to thank the governments of Sweden and Kenya and the United Nations Environment Program Secretariat for your leadership in making this 50th anniversary celebration such an inspired moment for us all. 1972 welcomed the Stockholm Declaration, which, for the first time, focused international attention on the vital relationship between a healthy environment, development, and poverty. There, Morris Strong called on participants to build new vehicle of international cooperation that will provide the optimum environment for human life on planet Earth. Morris Strong was a great Canadian. The Stockholm Declaration was the first step of 50 years of multilateral cooperation. Canada played a strong role encouraging new vehicles to drive multilateral environmental action forward. Vehicles such as the Montreal Protocol to overcome a global environmental threat, the thinning of ozone layer, and the Arctic Council, which put the Arctic environment and people at the forefront of circumpolar cooperation. Canada remains an engaged, good faith advocate for international cooperation including by co-chairing the Powering Pass Coal Alliance and the post-2020 global biodiversity framework process. We all understand that we're living a time of cascading global challenges. The brutal, unprovoked and illegal war of aggression waged by Russia against Ukraine. Humanitarian crises around the world which are fueled and worsened by extreme weather events. It is only through our cooperation that we're able to overcome the greatest environmental challenge of our time, the triple crises of climate change, rapid biodiversity loss, and rising pollution. Indeed, my colleagues, what is at stake goes well beyond matters of environmental cooperation and extends to the foundation of our communities and social order. If we're unable to find common cause for a livable world within the rule-based international order, then what do we have left? It's clear that more needs to be done and that governments alone cannot get us there. Selon la terminologie... According to the official UN terminology, we often use the terms parties, stakeholders, non-state actors or groups. But on this 50th anniversary of the Declaration of Stockholm, I believe that we need to adopt a new terminology and a new paradigm to better describe these participants. Civil society, organizations, all types of governments, uh, youth organizations, faith or groups are not only stakeholders, they're also partners of these governments. These partners uh, challenge us. They make us bolder in our action, and they ask that we act. They are indispensable for the implementation of these actions. Their voices are important, and they must not be left, left on the sidelines. They should be at the very heart of the action, side by side with the governance. We must also ensure constructive and solid engagement for indigenous peoples around the table. I am full of hope when I tell myself that 50 years later, the same slogan, one single earth, will again be heard around the planet during the global day for the environment next uh, Sunday. This celebration is an occasion to, uh, for us to show common optimism to find a better future, a healthier future, and a more prosperous future for all. Thank you. I thank the Minister of Cl Environment and Climate Change of Canada for his statement. I now give the floor to His Excellency Jasmine Al Mohammed, Acting Minister of Environment of Iraq. Thank you so much. I would like to start by uh, conveying my gratitude for this invitation which was extended to us to participate in this meeting, Stockholm plus 50. We for one are convinced that this meeting will lead to concrete and positive results. We'd also like to express uh, the gratitude of Iraq to the government of Sweden for the organization of this so important international meeting. Ladies and gentlemen, we are gathering here today at a time when the world enters 
into a new era where the environment lies at the very heart of a number of political, social, and economic issues. And this prompts us to work harder. And it behooves me to say here that Iraq has experienced a great many existential challenges between economic sanctions, terrorism, armed conflict, which have uh, all impacted uh, our citizens. And today, Iraq is facing a number of challenges uh, which remain economic, sociological, environmental, and so forth. Iraq today suffers from desertification. Iraq, which had been described in Greek and Roman manuscripts as a green land, the land of the hanging gov uh, gardens of Babylon, is today one of the most threatened states, threatened by desertification. In fact, one of the five most impacted countries by climate change. And you know that desertification today affects 39% of the territory of Iraq. 50% of our arable lands are losing, are losing their ability to provide crops to us. Now, the waters of the Euphrates and Tiger rivers, which are vital for our country, have seen a loss in their flow as a result of a number of dams being built. And of course, we see the impact on the sanitary status of our water. We believe that today, unfortunately, Iraq will experience a hydrological deficit of 10 billion cubic meters by 2035. Ladies and gentlemen, we're also experiencing an increase in sandstorms, which are so much more frequent today, and which, of course, uh, stem and put an end to life, whether it is uh, land-based transport or transport by air. And this leads, of course, to deaths, uh, people who simply choke, unable to breathe. We believe now, we believe that these uh, sandstorms, and we've experienced nine of them this year, will continue to increase in their frequency and intensity. And we believe that the number of days when our country will simply be paralyzed as a result of uh, these sandstorms, which is today is 272, will increase to 300 days by 2100. We also have to here refer to the fact that our population has increased spectacularly, and we're facing drought. And this means that a number of Iraqis were forced to, to leave their rural areas and move to the cities. And this, of course, leads to a great many difficulties uh, locally, regionally, and internationally. But Iraq, uh, however, continues to work. And uh, we have acceded to a number of international treaties, including the Paris Convention. And we have presented our national reports uh, and our NDCs, and we hope, we cherish the hope, that uh, we will enjoy the support of the international community when it comes to financing some of the programs that we have uh, elaborated to improve the status of the Euphrates and Tigris rivers. I thank the Acting Minister of Environment of Iraq for his statement. I now give the floor to His Excellency Jan Budai, Minister of Environment of Slovakia. Dear Chair, dear Madam Executive Director, distinguished colleagues, it is with much delight that I am attending in person a solemn moment such as the celebration of the 50th anniversary of the founding of the United Nations Environment Program. Over the past 50 years, UNEP has been the creator and guarantor of many key environmental conventions. The right to environmental protection and truthful information must be shared by all. Despite this, at this very time, we're witnessing perhaps irreversible environmental damage that occur as under the Russian aggression in Ukraine. In this context, one of multilateralism, I appeal to the member states of the United Nations to do their utmost to prevent further damage to the environment and the health of populations that are threatened by any aggression not only within Eastern Europe, 
but globally. At the same time, I greatly appreciate UNEP's efforts in resisting political pressure despite difficult situation, offering its expertise to map and document this damage despite the difficult situation. Environmental awareness currently has about as long a tradition in Slovakia as used to be the environmental ignorance. During the 40 years of communistic occupation that was included foreign military forces, the environmental protection has declined so substantially that even over the roughly same amount of environmental activist activism, we were not able to fully undo the harm caused. However, thanks to the global environmental agreements, we have entered into the past. We have been able to uplift the environment and steer Slovakia in a sustainable direction. Slovak Republic is fully aware of the fact that nature-based solutions have great potential for effective policy in addressing this worldwide crisis. Therefore, as a way out of it, Slovakia had set itself the objective of a recovery and resilience plan, which includes five priority areas with up to one third of all spending to be allocated to the green transformation of Slovakia. I welcome the 5 slash 14 resolution in which we agreed to establish an intergovernmental negotiating committee with a mandate to create an internationally legal binding agreement to end plastic pollution. Even as a landlocked country, we are responsible for taking measures to reduce plastic pollution in the seas and eliminate its sources. Dear colleagues, we're in the last decade on implementing the 2030 agenda. And even though we have been delayed by the pandemic, adding to it additional crises, this challenge I've already represented in UNOIA 5 in Nairobi in March this year, still continues to be contemporary and very urgent indeed. Let us put the environmental aid agenda and environmental solutions at the forefront of all policies. And let us seek nature-friendly solutions wherever possible. When else to sign up to this, if not in such a symbolic year, as when we commemorate the 50th anniversary of the founding of UNEP? I thank the Minister of Environment of Slovakia for his statement. I now give the floor to Her Excellency Steffi Lemke, Minister for the Environment, Nature Conservation, Nuclear Safety and Consumer Protection of Germany. Chair, Excellencies, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, multilateral environmental policy started 50 years ago here in Stockholm. We have made important progress since then. For example, the Rio Conventions, the 2030 Agenda, the Paris Agreement, and most recently, the agreement to pursue a plastics convention. Over the past 50 years, we have learned that multilateral environmental policy works even in time of crisis, when it is especially important. Environmental policy is a policy of peace. If we succeed in easy water shortages through climate action, diffusing conflicts over resources through circular economy, and preventing the spread of pandemics through biodiversity policy, then environmental policy can contribute to global peace. Global peace is currently under threat to the Russia's brutal war of aggression against Ukraine. Our highest priorities in the days and weeks ahead are to stop the suffering of the Ukrainian people and mitigate the global impacts of the war. Putin's army is using hunger as a weapon, posing a threat to global peace and stability. 
At the same time, we also have to tackle the threats arising from global environmental crises, global heating, biodiversity loss, environmental pollution, overfertilization, and resource exploitation. These also endanger peace and stability. This is why it is essential for the UN Biodiversity Conference COP15 to create an ambitious framework for biodiversity conservation this year. In my view, we cannot afford a further delay into next year. We have to continue work to keep more resources in the circular economy. We need to encourage the private sector to make production sustainable, while at the same time changing our consumption patterns. The Climate Change Conference, COP27, must advance implementation of the Paris Agreement, including progress on adaptation and dealing with loss and damage. I would like to thank Sweden and Kenya for making this exchange possible. I look forward to further discussions. Thank you. I thank the Minister for the Environment, Nature Conservation, Nuclear Safety and Consumer Protection of Germany for her statement. I now give the floor to Her Excellency Carolina Cerquera, Minister of State for Social Affairs of Angola. Madam Chair, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Government of the Republic of Angola, I take the floor at this meeting to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the United Nations Conference on Human Environment. Since the first time we met in the Concert of Nations came together in this city 50 years ago, we have had the opportunity to deepen the role of environmental challenges in favor of sustainable development and social welfare. We think about it, to think about environmental issues is preserving the present and to think very seriously about the future. But a warning must be made. The concern with environmental issues must be made to the present time. And in order to reverse these trends, it is necessary to adjust our development models, our production and consumption patterns, without losing sight, however, that eradicating poverty in all its forms and dimensions is an indispensable requirement for sustainable development. Excellencies, Africa emits only 4% of global greenhouse gas, but suffers disproportionately from the adverse effects of climate change. As our populations are more vulnerable, with no options, suffering from more, more from its consequences, especially drought, which has increased hunger and vulnerability, in some cases already impoverished. However, we are in line with the international consensus on sustainable development, including the Africa Agenda 2063, with the environment now appearing on the Angolan government's priority agenda. Angola plans to reach a target of 70% of energy from non-polluting sources by 2025, favoring clean energy from hydroelectric dams and solar energy. We approved the National Strategy for Climate Change and Environmental Education. And investments have been made in economic and social infrastructure to mitigate the effects of the prolonged drought that affects southern Angola, with an emphasis on a recently inaugurated aqueduct in the province of Kunen, with access to water being already assured in the extension of 160 kilometers for 350,000 citizens, thus guaranteeing better opportunities in food production and cattle raising. Angola is also engaged in the preparation of the United Nations Oceans Conference, bearing in mind the importance of the blue economy and marine pollution. We draw particular attention to the need to show solidarity, to fulfill the imperative of sharing the means of implementation in full recognition of the special situation and specific needs of developing countries. Financial resources, technical knowledge, and strengthening the capacity of our institutions are also everyone's responsibility. Excellencies, we are committed to the modernization of national environmental laws, to the integration of civil society, as well as the development of effective national mechanisms to enforce laws in this area. 
The relationship between man and nature cannot be one of exploitation, but one of symbiosis and mutualism. We must all do our part to make the earth a better place to live. Tomorrow is today. Thank you. Her statement. I now give the floor to His Excellency Adrian Peña, Minister of Environment of Uruguay. Gracias, Presidenta. Thank you, President. I would like to particularly thank the Government of Sweden, UNDP, and UNEP, particularly because of the fact that recently in Uruguay, very recently indeed, we've had a national consultation, and today I can present it as here at Stockholm Plus 50. Our country contributes very little to the problem of climate change and to the greenhouse effect. However, it is uh, an, an open economy based on agriculture and agro-industry with developed tourism industry, particularly along the coast. Uruguay, despite this, has stood out as a country which has implemented early mitigation measures, but its political priority is adaptation. And we are calling for political parity between mitigation and adaptation. We also, once again, here, call for the mobilization of the necessary resources for this very needed climate implementation action. Renewable sources of energy, electrical energy indeed, reached 98% over recent years, which confirms our path towards carbon decarbonization. We're working alongside the Ministry of Finance and Economy of our country and other ministries for a new sustainable sovereign bond, which will be linked to Uruguay's climate action. And yesterday we received the news that Uruguay will be the first host of the uh, negotiation committee for the legally binding instrument on plastics. This is extremely, uh, this is very much a source of pride for our country. The national preparations for this sh uh, shone, shone light on the importance of natural grasslands, one of the most vulnerable habitats. We have soil which is able to be a carbon sink and which can also be used as fodder. Today, we face a great challenge, however, for this environment's management. Our country is targeted at uh, improving its productive systems, factoring in natural uh, habitats, soil, and biodiversity. Environmental added value must lead to a higher quality of life of Uruguayans. This is at the core of our environmental policy. We have just presented, in the context of this forum, a tool to allow us to correct the measure and measure the effects of animal husbandry in the context of sustainable development. Our commitment is to measure, 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 and scientifically demonstrate that Uruguay is doing this in a sustainable fashion. We have many challenges, but Uruguayans, particularly the young who I'd like to particularly highlight, were part of the consultation, allowing Uruguay to be at the forefront of the transformation in terms of the climate. On a planet which will soon have 10 billion inhabitants, our country, Uruguay, a small country nestled between Argentina and Brazil, has huge capacity to generate food for sale and for its population. And this is a great contribution to the world's food security. Uruguay wants this to be done in a sustainable fashion. That is our commitment, to build up Uruguay as a sustainable food-producing country. Thank you very much. I thank the Minister of Environment of Uruguay for his statement. I now give the floor to Her Excellency Marie Orlea Vina, Minister of Environment and Sustainable Development of Madagascar. Monsieur le Secretaire General. Secretary General of the United Nations, Excellencies, Heads of State, Ministers, representatives of your respective countries, ladies and gentlemen, at the outset I'd like to thank the UN Secretariat for organizing this international conference celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Stockholm Declaration. I'd also like to send out my thanks to Sweden for hosting this memorable event. I am truly 
delighted and honored to extend my most warm greetings. We have met in the same place where 50 years ago we held the first uh, World Conference on the Environment in 1972, and uh, during which, other, among other nations, Madagascar came to an agreement on enhanced sustainable environmental management principles. In 1972, reflections were already taking place on economic growth, air pollution, water pollution, and ocean pollution, and human well-being. Fifty years on, we're, steer, we're here again, and these problems are still current. But we have other concerns as well, including climate change, degradation of our ecosystems, which all highlights the lack of our, the loss of our biodiversity uh, and uh, management of chemical and waste products. Ladies and gentlemen, the moments uh, such as these are an opportunity to recall the specificities of our countries as well as initiatives which we have undertaken. And here allow me to highlight Madagascar's efforts in that vein. Madagascar is one of the world's 10 hotspots for biodiversity. 12,000 species of plants are in our country, including as well as 363 reptile species and 238 amphibians. We have 283 bird species which take to the air in our skies, as well as 165 species of fish and 99 species of lemurs which are endemic in our country. Madagascar is a fabulous reservoir of natural farm ecology. In addition, since 1920, 1972, Madagascar has signed around 15 international conventions on the environment. Our island has already made great progress towards the protection of the environment and the promotion of sustainable development. However, we must recognize that our biodiversity endures the various man-made pressures, making it further more and more vulnerable. Uh, thus, the president of Madagascar has made environmental emergence one of his key priorities. and. Mm, the sustainable management of our natural resources, efforts such as the creation of uh, 143 protected areas, the protection of natural resources in harmony with economic development, and the social support for local communities uh, have been forthcoming. Indeed, 1,444 communities, local communities, have been empowered by transfers of our natural resources. Our goal of greening Madagascar has been coming on leaps and bounds over the years. And we have in reforested 71,000 hectares in 2021. Madagascar is also an African country which was a pioneer of uh, environmental standards. However, this work needs to be done here at the level of implementation with national, regional, and international partnerships. Ladies and gentlemen, we are the guardians of humanity. Let us together support forest for environmental, social, and economic benefits. Let's heighten our ambition for our present and our future, for us and for posterity. Thank you for your kind attention. I thank the Minister of Environment and Sustainable Development of Madagascar for her time constrained statement, and I've been asked to repeat the reminder that speakers abide by the time limits of three minutes for national statements and five minutes for statements delivered on behalf of groups. Speakers with longer statements are encouraged to read a shorter version of their text and to submit the full length of their statement to the Secretariat for posting on the conference website. To assist speakers in managing their time, a timer is being projected on the screen, and I would like to recall that the microphone will automatically, automatically be deactivated in case speakers exceed their time limits by more than a minute. This measure is being taken to ensure that everyone can deliver their statements in the limited time available for general debate. Thank you all for abiding by this measure. And now I'd like to give the floor to His Excellency Varna Tansos, Minister of Environment, Waters and Forests of Romania. Thank you, Mrs. Vice President. Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I am particularly honored to participate in this historical event of the commemoration of the 1972 Conference of the Human Environment. I would like to express my sincere appreciation and congratulate the governments of Sweden and Kenya for their work and the leadership in organizing this event. 50 years ago, the Conference of the Human Environment was the first UN conference addressing the environment. The Stockholm Declaration showed us that the environmental challenges can only be addressed through collective action, and the establishment of UNEP was an important movement, moment of strengthening the global environmental governance. 
Nevertheless, today, more than ever, the humanity and environment need our attention into, uh, in the context of Russia's unprovoked and unjustified act of aggression against Ukraine, which violates the international law and the UN Charter, endangers the environment and, uh, environment and contributes to global food and energy crisis. 50 years on, the challenges have multiplied, environmental degradation has intensified, and the planet's resources have depleted. The latest scientific reports demonstrate that we are facing a triple planetary, planetary crisis generated by climate change, biodiversity loss, and pollution, including the plastic pollution. We firmly believe that in this pivotal time, Stockholm 50 gives us the opportunity to urgently address the state of our planet, to effectively address the environmental problems, identify concrete solutions to achieve healthy planet for all of us, while accelerating progress on sustainable development goals through a greener, better, and inclusive recovery. In this regard, Romania considers that Stockholm 50, plus 50 should build on the historical achievements of UNEA 5.2 and UNEP 50, such as the launching of negotiation of the international, international, international negotiation committee towards the legally binding global agreement on plastics. We are firmly convinced of the importance of multilateralism in tackling the Earth's triple planetary crisis. We consider that we have to accelerate the implementation of the SDGs, Paris Agreement, the post-2020 global biodiversity framework, and implementing the post-COVID-19 recovery and resilience plan. As part of efforts to build a better Back, back better after the COVID-19 pandemic, we are focusing on implementation of the National Recovery and Resilience Plan, targeting investments and reforms in various sectors of the environmental environment, water, biodiversity, circular economy, waste management. As an EU member, Romania recognized the imperative of placing environmental management on the center of our relevant policies in order to achieve the transformative change towards sustainable and inclusive society. Let me conclude by saying that we have to use the momentum of Stockholm Plus 50 to turn on vision, turn on vision in reality. We have to make a, transformation, a transformative change. This change is possible. Thank you for your attention. I thank the Minister of Environment, Waters and Forests of Romania for his statement. I apologize to anyone whose name I've mispronounced. I now give the floor to His Excellency Duarte Cordero, Minister of Environment and Climate Action of Portugal. Honorable Presidents, Excellencies, Ladies and Gentlemen, on behalf of the Government of Portugal, allow me to congratulate the governments of Sweden and Kenya for organizing this inspiring meeting, remembering us that when there is a will, there is a way. Fifty years ago, the international community felt the need for a common outlook and for a common principles to inspire and guide the peoples of the world in the preservation and enhancement of the human environment. This was a huge step towards environmental protection and human development. Today, the world has changed, and despite all the lessons learned, the challenge remains huge when we speak about sustainable development or a healthy planet. Do we have the necessary conditions to rethink and recreate a better world in the line of the limits of our planet? And do we have the necessary will as the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres already told us, we believe we have the conditions, but we have to increase the political will. Climate change is happening. We have the scientific evidence that cannot be ignored. And if we want to win this battle, we need to accelerate implementation, build resilient win-win partnerships, and galvanize those who are still looking to the future with the glasses of the past. Portugal is fully committed to play its part in this path. In 2016, in Marrakech, we committed ourselves with climate neutrality by 2050. And since that day, we make all the efforts to turn words into actions. In 2019, we challenged ourselves to shut down our coal plants in 2023. We achieved it two years before. 
We developed a green hydrogen strategy and we are doing what is necessary for rapid implementation on the ground with a strong economic dynamism being created around this value chain. We made strong investments on renewables, firstly on hydro, wind and solar, and now repowering wind and hydro, investing in offshore wind and floating solar energy. Portugal is working hard to conserve its nat nature and biodiversity. We are bound to protect 30% of our territory by 2030, both on land and marine areas. We are strongly engaged with ocean conservation. We are also committed with UNEA 5.2 historic resolution to end plastic pollution and forge an international legally binding agreement by 2024. The second UN Ocean Conference co-organized by Portugal and Kenya that will be held in Lisbon will be another important milestone in our road to a healthy planet for the prosperity of all. We cannot rethink our planet without rethinking the way we conserve, use, protect the ocean. But we also need to protect the use of water. That's why Portugal will organize uh, within the UN conference a high-level symposium on water bridging SDG 6 and SDG 14. Portugal is strongly committed with sustainability and we are ready to go further in our ambition. This is a common gain where there will be only winners when all have won. Thank you very much and see you in Lisbon. I thank the Minister of Environment and Climate Action of Portugal for his statement. I now give the floor to Her Excellency Jasmine Fouad, Minister of Environment of Egypt. Thank you. Shall we start? Excellencies, ministers, participants to Stockholm Plus 50, all protocol reserved. Thanks to the government of Sweden for arranging that historical moment of celebrating Stockholm Plus 50, as well as the government of Kenya as a co-chair for that historical event. Leaders gathered 50 years ago in 1972 to commit to a safer and a healthy planet. So let us first pay attribute to the past contributors that laid the foundation for that, including but not limited to, to Dr. Mustafa Kamel Tolba, who has laid the basis for the first environmental diplomacy, environmental multilateralism, and linkage between science and policies. Excellences, Egypt remains after 50 years committed to its international obligation under the MEAs and comes here today to renew its commitment. But now, with a full set of institutional, regulatory and policy reforms at the national level, ensuring the multi-stakeholder process and a more robust environment for the private sector. This includes, but not limited to, a new waste management law, the first sovereign green bonds in the Middle East and North Africa, and an ambitious target of greening our national budget to reach 100% by 2030 to have green projects. Our continent is very vulnerable, and this required an urgent, speedy action that is inclusive but ensures equality, a total paradigm shift that is needed today for a transformative pathway, a pathway that's not an optional, but the only survival pathway that we need. Excellences. We all face common challenge and share one planet. We need to, sure, to ensure that there is no fixed one-size model, but we need flexible system to accommodate us all. On the road to COP27 in Sharm el-Sheikh and from Stockholm, we ensure that this COP would be an inclusive one that focuses on implementation, a just and transition uh, and ambitious action. And from that perspective, we need to look by the end of the year to our new generation and tell them we were able to provide your basic need of energy, water, and food in a sustainable manner, in a manner that we changed the way we behave towards the planet in order to have our planet 
embracing us all. Looking forward to receiving you all in Sharm el-Sheikh in November 2022. Thank you. I thank the Minister of Environment of Egypt for her statement. I now give the floor to His Excellency Fodai Jawad, Minister of Environment of Sierra Leone. Your Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, let me also join other speakers in thanking the government and people of Sweden for their hospitality since arriving in this environmentally friendly and clean country. 50 years after the creation of UNEP, the scientific basis for many of the world's environmental challenges are understood by most of us. All of us here agree that our earth is warming. The quality of the air we breathe or our sources of water are becoming poorer. And our forests, with their rich diversity of plants and animals, are disappearing, all as a result of human activity. The problem lies with us, not taking concrete steps to tackle environmental issues head on. We do not always use the abundance of incontrovertible scientific evidence that links environmental degradation to human actions when developing policies. In most cases, our policy decisions are swayed by either a backlash from voters, the prioritizing of short-term economic gain over long-term environmental sustainability, or both. Now is the time to change direction and focus on evidence-based policy making in tackling our environmental challenges. It is a challenge for us to use scientific knowledge about the causes of environmental challenges to inform a policy direction. Our government accepts this challenge, which is why about two years ago, we coalesced all government departments and institutions with environmental mandates that we are working in silos into a new standalone Ministry of the Environment. That decision has helped us to make a lot of progress in environmental governance in the last two years. We have established a climate change secretariat within the Ministry of the Environment and submitted a holistic NDC to UNFCCC and a national adaptation plan. Our national biodiversity strategy and action plans have also been reviewed. We are currently reviewing all the major national environmental legal instruments. These include laws to mandate the, to mandate the inclusion of environmental safeguards into an environmental, social, and health impact assessment study prior to implementing all development projects within an environmental appreciable and environmental footprint. We are also developing new legislations such as those governing the release of air pollutants and the management of plastics and electronic waste. An education curriculum including environmental and climate change issues are being developed in 2020. We launched a national tree planting program that plans to pl plant two, two, 5 million trees in 2024 and 30, 25 million trees by 2030. Mr. Chairman, the triple planetary crisis of biodiversity, climate change, and pollution, and how UNEP should address these issues going forward is, is critical. In conclusion, Sierra Leone remains firmly committed to all international agreements and actions to develop a climate resilient future. We assure you all that we will embrace development partner initiatives and promote a synergistic approach to knowledge exchange, technology transfer, and capacity building. Thank you for your attention. I thank the Minister of Environment of Sierra Leone for his statement. I now give the floor to Her Excellency Siti Nubara Bakar, Minister of Environment and Forestry of Indonesia. Excellencies and distinguished delegates, we gather today at critical juncture of our world. 
The pandemic has strained the global economy and development and environment. Today, we happily note that many undertakings on various international environmental cooperation, including under multilateral environmental agreement, are being gradually resumed. In this spirit, Indonesia emphasizes the importance of solidarity and collaboration, and I wish to share several essential points. First, concrete action and implementation is key. All stakeholders must step up their actions to address global crises, including climate, biodiversity, and pollution. We must be able to share and mobilize available innovation, technology, knowledge, and financial resources to fill the implementation gap among countries. Second, the role of youth as our main collaborator is paramount. We fully endorse Stockholm Plus 50 ideas of affording greater space for youth in our common undertaking. In Indonesia, together with youth and green leaders, we have been transmitting it into joint actions, including in recent program of mangrove rehabilitation. Their contribution to sustainable development are instrumental. Short, sustainable, and inclusive recovery must be our focus. COVID-19 pandemic has taught us many valuable lessons. We learned that no single country could recover on its own. Nobody is isolated because everyone is interconnected. Indonesia has appropriately incorporated these principles in its G20 presidency theme, Recover Together, Recover Stronger. We are determined to promote inclusive and resilient exit strategies for the benefit of all, including vulnerable low-income and small island developing countries. Excellencies, change can only happen if we transmit commitment into concrete action. Stockholm has clearly voiced it 50 years ago. We must use our knowledge to build, in collaboration with nature, a better environment for present and future generations. It is even more relevant today, so let us work together to achieve it. I thank you. I thank the Minister of Environment and Forestry of Indonesia for her statement, and I now give the floor to my dear friend, His Excellency Hans Dahlgren, Minister for European Union Affairs of Sweden. Thank you, Chair. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, when the uh, the leaders gathered here in Stockholm uh, 50 years ago. I also had the privilege to be there. I was a young television reporter at the time, and I can tell you it was a great experience to witness that unique event and to report on that historic Stockholm Declaration. A lot has been achieved since then, but uh, 50 years later, the urgency is even greater. As always on global issues, the key is multilateralism. To demonstrate a firm commitment to the multilateral system that we have developed since 1972 and that needs to be strengthened even more. Russia's war of aggression serves as a reminder of what is needed. The Russian invasion has not only led to immense suffering for the Ukrainian people, it has also had environmental consequences on an enormous scale. Threats have been made about the use of nuclear weapons. A nuclear exchange that would be a disaster for the environment and a threat to the survival of all of us. I find it imperative that we all work together to get rid of these horrifying weapons. When it comes to the climate and uh, the env environmental crisis, the direction has already been clearly pointed out. Commitments have been made. Targets have been set. Now is the time for action. Because the urgency has, cannot be overstated. The science is crystal clear. Our only chance is to act decisively and to act immediately. My government 
calls on all representatives here today to make sure that the promises that we have made to our citizens, that they become a reality. One way to make that happen is to embrace the ongoing green industrial revolution. Here in Sweden, thousands of jobs have been created by new green technology, and thousands more will follow. And this, I think, is the way forward, increasing the speed of the green transition through technology, through innovation, through growth, decent jobs, prosperity for all. And we can achieve this together. And also, of course, by engaging with civil society, and in particular, with the youth movement. I think Stockholm 50 could show that we are ready to act upon those voices of the young generation. It's all about saving the planet and about making it habitable for all future generations. And I think that can be no better commitment for the next 50 years. Thank you. I thank the Minister for European Affairs of Sweden for his statement. I now give the floor to His Excellency Mavai Radai De, Minister of Environment of Jordan. Thank you. Excellencies, heads of delegations, dear friends, on behalf of His Majesty King Abdullah II, let me begin by thanking the Kingdom of Sweden for hosting this global event with the support of the Republic of Kenya to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the UN Conference on Human Environment in Stockholm, the first to link the environment and human development. It has since paved the way for international dialogue between developed and developing nations, focusing on the linkages between economic growth environmental sustainability, and livelihoods of people all around the world. During the past 50 years, there have been huge efforts to ensure the principles of the Stockholm Declaration are adopted by all nations and that environmental management remains a focus in national planning. Jordan is located within the East Mediterranean region, which has been identified in scientific reports to be an environmental and climatic hotspot area. This challenge is amplified by economic, environmental, and social challenges, resource limitations, and sharp population growth due to regional crises and a large influx of refugees from neighboring countries. Despite these challenges, Jordan has always been at the forefront of mainstreaming climate action in policy and making strides towards the achievement of its sustainable development goals within the international cooperation frameworks and an active party of all relevant international treaties and agreements, including those on climate change, biodiversity, chemical use, and waste management. We have also been grateful for the strong relations and support from the Kingdom of Sweden in the areas of human rights and democratic governance sustainable use of trans transboundary water resources, and regional economic integration. At the national level, Jordan is finalizing the national climate change policy to be updated to 2050. Our nationally determined contributions were also updated, raising the ambition to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by 31 percent by the year 2030, with a total cost of implementation of 10 billion U.S. dollars and moving towards the global pursuit of carbon neutrality. We also have the National Green Growth Action Plan, which focuses on the sectors of energy, agriculture, water, transport, waste management, and tourism. To enhance implementation of these policies and ensure the climate and green economy measures continue to be the core of our national framework, Jordan is preparing to launch a 10-year roadmap to modernize its economy which puts green and sustainable practices at the core of our growth plans. Dear friends, we look forward to achieving our commitments and, be and being a model to other developing nations of how we can achieve economic growth and stability by focusing on the environment with the resources we have. It is also an important opportunity to emphasize the necessity 
to work collectively at the global level in an inclusive manner to face up to our common global environmental challenges. Progress can be made, but inclusive and sustainable growth cannot be achieved for all without developed countries fulfilling their promises and delivering on their financial pledges to enable developing countries to tackle the environmental challenges which are growing every day. We each have a role to play in ensuring the stability of our planet for future generations, and each nation must do its part. Jordan will continue to, to be a part of this global effort and aspire to be a leader in the region in sustainable development. I thank you for the opportunity to address this distinguished body today and reaffirm our commitment to the global climate goals. Thank you. I thank the Minister of Environment of Jordan for his statement. I now give the floor to Her Excellency Aminath Shauna, Minister of Environment, Climate Change and Technology of the Maldives. Thank you. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, assalamu alaikum and a very good afternoon to all. Today we mark five decades to the 1972 UN Conference on Human Environment. We have achieved much, but today I'd like to also remind ourselves on the difficult road ahead of us. We need to do much more to enhance our collective efforts to achieve a safer world. We have just 90 months to go to limit global temperatures to 1.5 degrees. As a coral reef island nation abundant in marine resources, the Maldives is continuously working towards enhancing climate resilient policies that can adapt us to live in the Maldives as we have done for thousands of years. We are addressing coastal challenges through integrated coastal zone management, early warning and early actions, and knowledge sharing. Protection of our reefs is critical for us to achieve economic and social well-being. We have legally protected 13% of the total coral reef area in the Maldives. We also aspire to achieve net zero target by 2030 with international support, which is to be reached through interventions in energy, transport, and waste sectors. We are working to protect at least 20% of our oceans as well. Plastics is a pressing environmental issue for the Maldives. We are currently implementing a single-use plastic phase-out plan through which a total of 13 single-use plastic items will be gradually phased out by 2023. It is truly a pleasure for me to announce today that from yesterday onwards, the production and sales of the selected single-use plastics have been banned in the Maldives. This is going to address the majority of our plastic problem in the Maldives. Distinguished delegates, we have a shared responsibility for the sustenance of life in our planet. And I look forward to collaboration between member states in achieving our goals. Looking back on what we have achieved in the past 50 years, even with many challenges in our way, I have no doubt and through multi mutual cooperation, we can leave behind a legacy of a healthy, more resilient planet Earth for the generations to come. We in the Maldives want to continue to live in our islands. We don't want to be climate refugees. If we collectively act now, I believe we can, and we have just 90 months to do. Thank you. I thank the Minister of Environment, Climate Change and Technology of the Maldives for her statement. I now give the floor to His Excellency Sheikh Faleh bin Nasser bin Ahmed bin Ali Al Thani, Minister of Environment and Climate Change of Qatar. In the name of God, the merciful, the compassionate, thank you for giving me the floor, sir. May the peace of God be upon you. I 
am pleased to be able to convey my gratitude to all of those who have contributed in Sweden and in Kenya to prepare this meeting. It is clear, ladies and gentlemen, that the topic of this meeting is a topic that uh, focuses <clears throat> on common responsibility. For this reason, we need to be responsible and better implement the commitments which were undertaken during the Stockholm meeting back in 1972. <clears throat> However, the fact uh, that we are here at Stockholm Plus 50 shows the interest of the international communities uh, in the environment, its protection and sustainable development. Indeed, in Qatar, we have a sustainable development plan. <clears throat> running through 2030. And within this framework, uh, we have attempted to implement our commitments uh, and turn them into genuine action in terms of the environment. Last year, we launched Qatar's national strategy in the field of the environment, uh, especially focusing on climate change. This is a strategy which will serve to guide all of our actions. Uh, to protect our environment. And in this context, we would like to state here that the state of Qatar has recently announced a ban on the use of plastic bags. So today, plastic bags are banned in Qatar. They will be replaced by products which are a great deal more environmentally friendly. We also have, last year, elaborated the national strategy on climate change, which enable us to undertake a number of actions which allow us uh, to reduce the negative and pernicious impacts of climate change. Qatar has also undertaken a number of international initiatives aimed at contributing to the preservation of the international environment. And uh, we have provided assistance to a number of uh, smaller developing states to help them meet the challenges of climate change. <coughs> Last May, Qatar also announced a, um, a grant of $2 million to meet the challenges of the problems resulting from the beached tanker off the coast of Yemen. Ladies and gentlemen, you know that we are going to host the 2022 World Cup. This will be the first World Cup, which will be held in a carbon neutral format. We also have a number of goals in the field of reforestation. We have an extremely bold reforestation plan, and I'd like to thank you for your attention. Environment and climate change of Qatar for his statement. I now give the floor to Her Excellency Roni John, Minister of Environment, Climate Change and Natural Resources of the Gambia. Assalamu alaikum to all here present. Co-President, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the President of the Republic of the Gambia, please allow me to convey appreciation to the government of Sweden and Kenya for co-hosting the Stockholm Plus 50 highly level meeting to commemorate the 50 year anniversary of the first UN conference of the human environment held here in Stockholm. The theme of this meeting, a healthy planet for prosperity of all our responsibility, our opportunity is very relevant. We need to team up and act smartly to sustainably respond to the environmental and development challenges now and not tomorrow. To continue on this, to achieve the 1972 Stockholm Conference, which was a modern launch part of today's global environment movement and the principle adopted, they are still relevant for saving our natural and human environment. At the heart of the agreed principle of that meeting was common but differential, differentiated responsibility in managing our environment. And the main principle is the need for solidarity among states to tackle our sustainable development goals, our common agenda. As we reflect on the Art Summit of 1972, as the basis of this meeting, it is important to review how far we have gone in terms of achieving the recommendations 
of that meeting as a nation. In this regard, the government of the Gambia is pleased to report that it has long since ratified, domesticated, and implemented a number of international treaties and institutions and instituted key strategies and policies that are meant to support achieving a healthy planet for all. We call for an increase in development financing earmark to ensure the flexibility and predictability needed to deliver a program to support building a prosperous and healthy planet with structural transformed economics that leaves no one behind, especially the least developed and the middle income countries. We need, we are meeting at a time when COVID-19 is just around to distract us from achieving the sustainable development goals. It is a major health, social, economic, and humanitarian challenges that was not seen before today. Globally, the pandemic serves as a wake-up call, especially in regards to exposing the huge level of inequality in the world. Going forward, the lesson learned must lead to increased global solidarity, partnership, and working together in a coherent and coordinated manner to attain our Agenda 2030 and, of course, the Sustainable Development Goals. Our goal must be a better and secured future for all and to act urgently and now. This is the time, we, this is the time when many countries in the world are concerned about the achieving, achievement of peace and security, access to vaccine, reduce poverty, manage debt crisis, unemployment, adapting to the climate change and other environmental challenges, and in general, reviving the momentum of achieving the SDGs. Therefore, the strategy, the strategy to, to recover from the COVID-19 pandemic should focus on tackling vaccine access, equality, employment creation, and of course, climate financing. It will also require strengthening our health system, promoting research, addressing specific vulnerability, supporting and advocating the adoption of conflict-sensitive lenses to the development programs of the UN body and all of us together. For, for countries like the Gambia, that depends on tourism, delays in addressing these challenges would continue to have a devastating consequences on our economy, and it is our strong belief that the outcome of Stockholm 50 will provide the international community with the required strategies direct direction. I thank the Minister of Environment, Climate Change and Natural Resources of the Gambia for her statement. I now give the floor to His Excellency Juan Cabadide, Minister of Environment and Sustainable Development of Argentina. Thank you. environmental problems. Well, we looked at these 50 years ago, and they have increased on an unprecedented level. The existence of human life is just jeopardized, at least as we've understood it up until now. We need to change our systems of production and consumption, as well as our ways of relating to nature. Sustainability should be urgently carried out because there is no plan B. We know that this recommendation is not easy. It means affecting economic interests. Because of that, we will ensure, we, we believe that the fairest thing to do is to apply the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities and to bear this out through financing and implementation mechanisms with clear investment goals which are specific. As developing countries, we are not the instigators of the environmental crisis. The responsibility lies with developed countries which did not pay due attention to environmental concerns. We don't want to have problems. What we want is sustainability on the basis of the understanding that Latin America and the Caribbean is not the continent polluting and destroying the planet. We have come to defend the peoples of Latin America and the Caribbean. We are not second-class citizens. 
as developing nations, we must face a double burden of transforming our productive systems and solving problems of structural poverty and exclusion. Because of this, without financing, uh, the transition will worsen existing challenges. We require new resources to make progress with environmental and climate agenda. These resources must be provided by developed countries, which were the great winners of this production model and who in 2009 committed to do this. They have not yet done so. There is no fair transition otherwise. There is no fair transition without com fulfilling the financing commitments. The moment to act is now. In the field of climate change, we need to see the new collective quantitative uh, goal being balanced between mitigation and adaptation. In terms of biodiversity, we must have a post-2030 uh, framework which is reasonable, including measures for implementation so that we can live in harmony with nature. In addition, international organizations should enhance their efficiency and agility to distribute and roll out resources. In short, we need commitment from developed countries for them to finance global production changes. According to recent reports, this is equivalent to billions of dollars per year. As Pope Francis said, let us care for our common home because Argentina, Latin America, and the Caribbean, we have, you owe, the world owes us a great environmental debt. Thank you. I thank the Minister of Environment and Sustainable Development of Argentina for her, his uh, statement. I now give the floor to Her Excellency Elba Rosa Perez Montoya, Minister of Science, Technology and Environment of Cuba. Buenas tardes. Good afternoon, distinguished co-presidents and heads of delegation. We thank the U UN system, as well as the governments of Sweden and Kenya, for hosting and organizing this important meeting. When we are commemorating the 1972 Stockholm Conference, today we have a multilateral framework to address environmental issues led by UNEP, with dozens of agreements in force which have been critical to protecting mankind and our planet. Notwithstanding that, the problems remain unsolved. Fifty years on, we are grappling with the consequences of a triple environmental crisis. Pressure caused by humankind on nature continues, and it is exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic and an economic recession. According to the World Bank, extreme poverty has risen by 1% in 2021. And while there is poverty, we will not have a safe and healthy environment. Many countries, in fact, the countries where more than 60% of the world's population live, have to deal with critical problems such as food security, access to drinking water, and access to health and education services. A new form of environmental government is required, as well as national policies, resources, and access to technology without selectivity or discrimination. Governments, the UN system, and all sectors of society must implement the global strategy for consumption, sustainable consumption and production by 2030. This has been submitted to an initial consultation with member states during the recently held forum of the One Planet Network. Let us put an end to consumerism. Let us change uh, advertising and turn it into messages to raise environmental awareness. Let us leverage our knowledge, science, and technological development to heal the planet. An alliance for peace and well-being of the planet is required, and it needs to mobilize additional funds to help the environment. With merely 3% of the quantity which in 2021 the 15 countries which spend the most on military uh, affairs invested, we would uh, uh, we 
we would solve many climate issues without cooperation and alliances, without peace and respect, without inclusion and participation of all countries, we will not achieve prosperity and a healthy planet. President Cuba, the only country in the world which has the longest economic, commercial and financial blockade in history imposed by the US, which has intensified opportunistically during the pandemic, we stand firm with our will to implement multilateral commitments for the environment to achieve dignity and equality. Because of this, we should look forward to Stockholm Plus 100 for the well-being of present and future generations. Thank you. I thank the Minister of Science, Technology and Environment of Cuba for her statement. And I will now give the floor to Her Excellency Emma Curry, Minister of the Environment and Climate Change of Finland. Distinguished Presidents, Ministers, dear friends. Fifty years ago in Stockholm, a group of visionary leaders gathered to establish the UN Environment Programme. A lot has been achieved since then, but many new challenges have emerged. Today we need to be just as bold as those leaders 50 years ago to solve the triple planetary crisis we are facing. The past two years have shown that the world is capable of quick transitions. Now we need a quick green transition that leaves no one behind. In particular, we need to involve youth in all decision-making that affects their future. A key to solve environmental crises lies in circular economy and promotion of sustainable consumption and production. I am happy to tell that last year, Finnish government set for the first time a gap to curb the overconsumption of natural resources. Following the Stockholm Conference in 1972, ministries of environment were established around the world and also in Finland. Our Ministry of Environment has always been effective and agile. Only this year, our ministry has prepared a new Climate Act and a new Nature Protection Act that helps significantly to address both climate change and nature loss. Our ministry has also just started a preliminary assessment on a completely new Nature Act that would resemble the Climate Act and would bring stopping biodiversity loss and becoming nature positive into our legislation. Internationally, we are happy to be a part of making of a new global strategy for a sustainable consumption and production beyond 2022. Finland will do its part by supporting the implementation of the strategy with the financial contribution of 1 million euros. Dear friends, Finland has the honor to act as co-chair with Egypt in Leadership Dialogue 3. Common messages have emerged around the need to scale up and mobilize finance as well as enhancing governance, institutional reforms and partnerships. In particular, the discussion on phasing out fossil fuels has triggered many concrete proposals which, which I find important and encouraging. All our actions must be in line with tackling the triple planetary crisis we need to take those actions today. Thank you. I thank the Minister of the Environment and Climate Change of Finland for her statement, and I now give the floor to His Excellency Flavien Joubert, Minister of Agriculture, Climate Change and Environment of the Seychelles. Thank you. Chair, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I bring you warm greetings from the President of the Republic of Seychelles and also from the people of Seychelles. My delegation would like to express its gratitude to the Kingdom of Sweden for welcoming us here 
and the co-hosts, the Government of Kenya and the Secretariat for the excellent organization of this meeting. It is indeed an honor and a privilege to address this very important meeting, celebrating 50 years of the United Nations Environment Programme under the banner, A Healthy Planet for the Prosperity for All, Our Responsibility, Our, our Opportunity. Over these years, many have prospered, but at what cost to the natural environment, to human lives, and to the future prospects of humankind? Today, we face an environmental emergency that threatens much of the world's population. It should be obvious to all of us that we do not have a choice. If we want to leave a legacy for our children, we must implement urgent actions now. For small island states, it is even more than a legacy. It is about the continued existence of entire nations. Seychelles as a seed has recognized the relationship between the health of the environment and our survival. For many years, and more so today, we continue to call for concrete and meaningful action to reverse the trend of climate biodiversity loss and environmental pollution. We call for strong collective ambitions and actions. We also call for attention to the means of implementation and the differentiated responsibilities and capabilities of nations such as our own. Seychelles has, take, has taken strategic actions aimed at early achievement of global targets. 30% of our EZ and 50% of our land are under protection, supported by an innovative financing mechanism. We have phased out single-use plastics, and we have, had, we have committed to protect our blue carbon stocks comprising of seagrass and mangroves by 2030. These bold decisions are our, are our contribution to the world and an appropriate signal to what can be possible. We remain firmly committed to the global ambitions, but it is not easy as we graduate from middle to higher income status. GDP doesn't say much about the cost of, our, of the climate impacts, about the fragility of our economy, about the cost of safeguarding our ocean space and about our energy challenge. We invite all partners to reflect on how equity can be enhanced to enable seeds and developing countries to continue on the path of sustainable development. UNEP at 50 should be a celebration of success, but also admission of failures in, in achieving the environmental related SDGs. We must acknowledge the efforts of UN agencies, other bodies and alliances, especially AOCs, for communicating the strong ambitions and commitments to action of small island states. While we celebrate, we must also, also think about how we can consolidate the hard-won gains of the past 50 years and embark on a route that would give all nations, big and small, a sense of hope for the next 50 years and beyond. Dear delegates, our common agenda for the future should focus on arresting this slide into oblivion through a just transition that leaves no country or group behind. Let us be bold. Let us be resolute. I thank you. I thank the Minister of Agriculture, Climate Change and Environment of Seychelles for his statement, and I now give the floor to Her Excellency Tamar Zandberg, Minister of Environmental Affairs of Israel. Thank you, Excellencies, colleagues, friends. 50 years ago at the conference here in Stockholm, for the very first time, issues like air pollution, water pollution, and the state of the oceans paved their way to the core of public discourse. At the international level, it led to the establishment, to the establishment of UNEP, an environmental multilateralism. At the national level, it led to the creation of government agencies for the environment, including the Israeli Environmental Protection Service, established in 1973. On behalf of the State of Israel, I wish to commend the government of Sweden for hosting this conference with the support of the government of Kenya. I wish also to congratulate UNEP for 50 years of global environmental leadership. But at the same time, I must sadly admit that we have not achieved enough in the past 50 years. Let us take this moment to commit to do more, better, and faster. Dear friends, following the historic Abraham Accords, new winds of peace are blowing through the Middle East, and with them, new opportunities to make peace with nature. This is because we recognize that in our region, we share challenges as a global hotspot for climate change 
that leaves us no choice but act together. That is the reason we discuss with our regional peace partners bold new environmental initiatives, including a joint regional action group to address climate adaptation and other burning environmental issues, such as adapting to challenges like desertification, water scarcity, and biodiversity loss, and also in, on innovative technologies we can share with the rest of the world. Israel is highly committed to advancing global and regional cooperation. Dear friends, I wasn't born yet in 1952. However, I feel that I belong to the future generation of the 1952 conference. We are gathered here today, the next generation, and we already have younger generation that we are committed to. And we are gathered here today to review the successes of the last 50 years, but also we need to stress how crucial it is to keep working together in the next 50 years so we can truly build a sustainable, resilient, and livable future for all. Thank you. I thank the Minister of Environmental Affairs of Israel for her statement and now give the floor to Her Excellency Viviane Heijnen, Minister for the Environment of the Netherlands. Distinguished Presidents, Your Excellencies, distinguished colleagues, as you can see, I'm not here on my own. Let me introduce you to A.V. Vett, who is here to represent young people. We want the youth to be given a voice in, in environmental policy. This conference is about the future. It's about their future. It's up to us to ensure that there is a future for young people and that there are healthy prospects for all passing on our planet in a better state to the next generations. Let's make that our number one priority in everything we do. That's the kind of solidarity that motivates me to take on the challenges we face. You're all aware of those challenges. We're all being confronted with the triple crisis of biodiversity loss, pollution, and climate change, while at the same time trying to achieve the sustainable development goals. Stockholm Plus 50 is making the urgency very clear. So thank you to the government of Sweden for hosting this special conference together with Kenya. The Netherlands is calling for more ambition and action in two main areas. The circular economy is our number one. Sustainable production and consumption are key solutions in combating the triple crisis. And water. Water is crucial to a better future and we need more global action in this area. That's why the Netherlands is co-hosting the UN 2023 Water Conference together with Tajikistan. We have no time to lose. So let's take action, let's join forces, and let's give young people a voice. And on that note, I'd like to give the floor to A.V. Vett. Thank you. I'm part of eight youth representatives who actively contribute and take part in Dutch delegations to multinational conferences and negotiations. We highly encourage other countries to include younger generations and future generations in their environmental policies. The Dutch government is now investigating a so-called generation assessment for future policies. This will assess the impact of policy making on future generations. Furthermore, the Dutch Environmental Youth Council is currently co-writing our national environmental program. We are calling on you, leaders, and all of society for ambitious commitments, concrete actions, and swift implementation here in Stockholm, and at further events and negotiations. We, together with the Minister, would like to thank you. I thank the Minister 
for the environment of the Netherlands and her able assistant for her statement. And now give the floor to Her Excellency Jean Diak Mujawa Maria, Minister of Environment of Rwanda. Excellencies, on behalf of His Excellency President Paul Kagame, the people of Rwanda, it is my pleasure to join you to commemorate 50 years since the 1972 United Nations Conference on the Human Environment. For almost three decades, Rwanda has put the environment first, from conserving and expanding protected areas to acting, to setting ambitious climate targets and tackling plastic pollution. In Rwanda, we know that to protect our environment, we must invest in people. That is why we need to run from the unprecedented health and economic challenges brought about by COVID-19. We cannot allow the pandemic to further exacerbate inequality nor cause greater damage to our environment. Excellencies, in Rwanda, over the last few months, we had a series of Stockholm Plus 50 consultations with young people, women, community leaders, people living with disabilities, the private sector and the policy makers to ask, what does a green future look like to you? Their responses were clear and powerful. They envision a climate-resilient planet with the environment at the center of our way of life. They see zero plastics in, in the nature, well-paying and dignified green jobs for young people and greater accountability for polluters. For this to be achieved, however, we need to start investing in the future. Finance for climate change adaptation must increase. A global commitment to the principles of loss and damage must be prioritized. New financing partnerships must be accompanied by accountability measures that ensure the promise made in Paris are honored. From the hundreds of people who took part in this consultation in Rwanda, it was clear that there is no shortage of idea or will to address the crisis we face. It is now up to us to hear these calls and respond with action. Achieving an international legally binding treaty to plastic pollution by 2024, universal ratification of the Kigali Amendment to the Montreal Protocol, and greater investment in nature-based solutions are important priorities for Rwanda. We look forward to working with member states and partners to make them a reality. Excellencies, Rwanda is committed to working with all stakeholder all stakeholders to secure a healthy and prosperous planet for all. Let us be inspired by the passion, insight, and action of communities around the world who are telling us they are ready to do more together. I thank you very much. I thank the Minister of Environment for Rwanda for her statement and now give the floor to His Excellency Mohamed Abdul Kadar Musa, Minister of Environment and Sustainable Development, Djibouti. Merci, Madame la thank you, thank you so much, uh, Madam Chair. The name of God, the merciful, the compassionate, ladies and gentlemen, ministers, uh, distinguished guests. I am gratified to find myself here amongst you in the special conference which celebrates 50 years of progress following the United Nations Conference on the Environment of 1972. This conference was the first of a new tradition, an annual new tradition opening an era of new cooperation, common strategies on environmental issues. It's also during this conference, as you know, that uh, the concepts of sustainable development 
and the new agency responsible for the environment uh, was given birth to it also during this conference in Stockholm that the world understood that with leadership and uh, common efforts in the field of the environment, fruitful cooperation between states was indeed possible. Distinguished guests, uh, a healthy planet for the prosperity of all. I come from a small country from the Horn of Africa, known for its great heart, the Republic of Djibouti. And I would like to speak to you about the achievements that we have made regarding the environment in my country following 1972. And the Rio summit, which was a pivotal point in history, the Republic of Djibouti, like most countries, has ratified and signed all of the uh, Rio conventions, as well as other multilateral agreements on the environment. But through un until 1997, we had no Minister of the Environment. Following that, that, we did. And at an international level, we placed the environment uh, at the heart of international relations. Republic of Djibouti, wishing to make this a key issue, back in 1990, created a Ministry for the Environment, uh, which is also responsible for uh, the territory as a whole. It is uh, after 20 years in 2021 that the Republic of Djibouti took the most important step, creating a ministry devoted to sustainable development and the environment. Distinguished guests, it was necessary. I would even say that it was clear for the governments of Djibouti to set up a ministerial department specifically dealing with the environment. Indeed, the situation today is alarming. Figures show us that every three seconds, uh, as a result of human activity, we lose a uh, football fields worth of land. You can see the catastrophe to it, towards which we are moving if we don't react rapidly. The Republic of Djibouti stands on the front line in the fight against climate change for the reduction of greenhouse gases, as well as through the development of adaptation measures to strengthen and bolster the resilience of a population. In addition to this, in our collaboration with technical financial partners, the government of Djibouti has spared no effort to reverse the trend and to put an end to the degradation of the land and the environment and to catalyze uh, and bolster all of the measures aimed at fighting this. I'd like to seize this opportunity to to sound the alarm regarding the situation in the Horn of Africa. The countries of the region are facing, are facing uh, increased drought. It threatens all the vulnerable population. If we don't attenuate it very rapidly, this will lead to a humanitarian crisis. The Republic of Djibouti, just like all of its neighboring states, uh, has been uh, struck by this crisis. Close to 17 percent of the population in Djibouti's territory are today impacted by the adverse effect of drought. In addition, they are facing the specter of food insecurity provoked by the increase in the price of food and exacerbated by the Ukrainian crisis. And this drought is today the most important climate emergency, and it is associated with a pressing food crisis. I thank you for your attention. I thank the Minister of Environment and Sustainable Development of Djibouti for his statement and now give the floor to Her Excellency Yvette Joachim Maibaze, Minister of Land and Environment of Mozambique. Thank you. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, all protocol observed. On behalf of the Government of the Republic of Mozambique and on my own name, I would like to express the greatest appreciation for the invitation addressed to the country to participate in the International Conference Stockholm Plus 50, which takes place under the slogan, A Health Planet for the Prosperity of All, Our Responsibility, Our Priority. The participation of, all, of our country in this event is of supreme importance given the nomination of His Excellency Philippe Jacinto News, President of the Republic of Mozambique, as champion of the African Union for his performance in the management of natural disasters in recognition to the efforts for the mitigation of impacts of natural disasters. Therefore, Mozambique was highlighted in recognition to the country's institutional structure arranged to cope with extreme natural events and its ability to prevent the loss of life and goods. Ladies and gentlemen, the results of the national consultation towards the preparation of this conference allowed the elaboration of key issues for Mozambique on which we highlighted the need to develop partnership and build capacity to access climate change funds, 
establish support mechanisms directed to local communities, support decentralized and inclusive decision making on the design and implementation of environmental and development policies and projects, expand the role of the private sector, especially small and medium enterprises, increase public awareness of the environment. The national consultation were also a moment of reflection on government action and milestones in which the voice addressed the following. Adhesion to international conventions and protocols on the conservation and biodiversity and environmental protection, approval of legal framework policies and normative instruments on planning of space, environment, forestry and biodiversity conservation, creation of specific institutions and strengthening of existing ones to respond to environmental matters. Ladies and gentlemen, Mozambique is a candidate for non-permanent seat as a member of Security Council for the period 2023-2024. As part of its strategy, Mozambique elected climate change issues as one of the main themes to be promoting during his mandate. At Security Council, Mozambique intends to share and exchange experience aimed to protect our planet from the adverse effects of climate change. In this context, we would like to thank you to your government for the support to Mozambique to enter in that important organ on the United Nations. I would like to take this opportunity to congratulate representatives of governments and participants, and particularly the governments of Sweden and Kenya, for conducting this process towards the construction of an increasing sensitive planet to matters related to climate change. Thank you for your attention. I thank the Minister of Land and Environment of Mozambique for her statement and now give the floor to His Excellency Burpenda Yadav, Minister of Environment, Forest and Climate Change of India. Thank you. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, 50 years ago, the first UN Conference on Human Environment held here in Stockholm refine the human-environment interaction at global level. The principles outlined during the 1972 conference remain relevant today. Climate justice aims at providing level playing field to all communities across the world by empowering them with financial and technological interventions. Excellencies, we aim for a futuristic, inclusive and sustainable development. Towards this ambition, India has worked with partners for significant global initiatives that include the Leadership Group of Industry Transition, International Solar Alliance, Infrastructure for Resilient Island States, and Coalition for Disaster Resilient Infrastructure. The principle of United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change like equity, common but differentiated responsibility and respective capabilities are the basis for providing dignified life to all across the world based on respective national circumstances. Excellencies, India, with one-sixth of the humanity, is the world's largest democracy and the faster-growing large economy. India is one of the few nations who have delivered its climate action commitments and increasing use of renewable energy going forward. India is one of the world's mega biodiversity regions and has been increasing its forest cover and restoring wildlife. During the last decade, India has seen large-scale inclusive economic development. We have increasingly achieved this development by disengaging the development process from environmental degradation. Excellencies, mankind has made exemplary development in the field of technology, digital transformation and communications. This is the time to use this to make a better world. India has one of the youngest populations in the world. Today, youth are at the center of creativity, innovation, and indigenization of new technologies, including in the areas of environment and climate actions. Despite the COVID challenges, a large number of unicorns, come ha uh, unicorns have come up in India. Excellencies, Mother Earth is for all of us. The Paris Agreement has also recognized the culture of living in harmony with the nature. With this view, 
Honorable Prime Minister of India advocated the concept of life, that is, lifestyle for environment, as an approach to combating climate change. It promotes mindful consumption, reduction of waste, and promotion of resource efficiency and circular economy. Excellencies, the theme of this conference, Healthy Planet for Prosperity of All, reminds me of the millennia, millennia old Sanskrit verses from ancient in, in script, Indian scripture. I recite in Sanskrit, Om Sahana Vautu, Sahana Bunaktu, Sahaviryam Karvavahi, Tejasvina Vadi Tamastu, Ma Vidvisha Vahe, which means, may we all be protected, may we all be nourished, may we work together with great energy, may our intellect be sharpened. Let there be no animosity amongst us. Excellencies, we need to ensure that when a Stockholm conference turns 75, it can look back with satisfaction of our collective action to leave no one behind. Thank you. I thank the Minister of Environment, Forest and Climate Change of India for, her, for his statement and now give the floor to Her Excellency Nisreen Tamimi, Minister, Head of the Environment Authority of the State of the Palestine. Thank you. Thank you. Al-Sayyidat wa Sada al-Hudur al-Muhtarameen, ma hafz al-Alqaa. Ladies and gentlemen, August Assembly, peace be upon you. To start, allow me to convey my gratitude uh, for my presence here at this very important conference. Allow me to also extend the greetings of His Excellency President Mahmoud Abbas, President of the Palestinian State. This conference is a pivotal point in the field of environmental action at a global level. It comes 50 years after the Stockholm Conference. Our planet has experienced serious events and developments which require action. We have seen an increase in the phenomena of pollution, desertification, as well as the loss of biodiversity. And there's also a deterioration in the methods of consumption and production. And this has an impact on our natural resources. And there is an increase in waste, especially hazardous waste. All of us have witnessed the phenomenon of climate change, which has impacted all development sectors. Ladies and gentlemen, global attempts have increased, uh, attempting to combat climate change. The last one is the Sustainable Development uh, Goals uh, of 2030. We also have the international conventions in the field of the environment and the various trust funds, uh, all of which are another attempt to meet the challenges posed by these threats. However, we have a great deal of responsibility when it comes to meeting these challenges. COVID-19 is proof if there was a need for any, uh, for it has affected the whole world. And we in Palestine were affected by it too. It has impacted our plans, our agendas. And uh, as a result of this, uh, we have had to find new methods to meet all of these threats. We in Palestine have adopted the 2020 program, we've adopted the various legal institutional measures required to improve the situation in the field of the environment and to manage our natural resources in a way that would serve future generations. We have adopted many strategies and plans of action, such as the environmental strategy, the intersectoral environmental strategy, the biodiversity strategy, and the national consumption method plans. We have the various national reports as well as plans of action. However, the Israeli occupation exacerbates existing threats and hampers the achievement of the SDGs and the implementation of environmental policies and plans for the occupying force controls uh, water resources and natural resources, especially in the sea region, and uh, they're confiscating 
Palestinian lands and uh, waging unending war against the Gaza Strip. And this, of course, has an environmental impact. The international community must take action to put an end to the Israeli occupation and thus allow Palestinians to enjoy their freedom and their right to self-determination, as well as the establishment of a Palestinian state, uh, which would be free and would have East Jerusalem as its capital. Therefore, there is a need to undertake all the necessary measures to ensure that we are able to preserve our assets, our natural resources, and thus contribute to sustainable development. I thank you. I thank the Minister, Head of the Environment Authority of the State of Palestine for her statement, and now give the floor to Her Excellency Suad Eitayeb, Minister of Labor and Administration Reform of Sudan. In the name of God, the merciful and compassionate, and the President, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to start by conveying my gratitude to you and to congratulate you upon your election to the presidency of this conference and wish you every possible success. We would like to assure you of our full cooperation. And we'd also like to convey gratitude to the government of Sweden for the efforts made in organizing this very important international meeting. We would also like to associate ourselves with uh, the statement made by the G77 and China, as well as that of the African group, ladies and gentlemen. All of us here are convinced of the importance of the environment, especially in the field of sustainable development. And we're also convinced of the need to step up the efforts undertaken to achieve the commitments which have been undertaken in the past uh, and to achieve sustainable development. However, we find ourselves today after the COVID-19 crisis, and we know that a great Many millions have lost their jobs. Uh, entire sectors of the economy were destroyed. And of course, there is a problem of debt, which affects developing states. Uh, states uh, who are now facing the three major environmental crises. Madam President, we would like to state here that Sudan is able to ensure its food security at regional and international levels. And we would therefore like to turn to the UN and all of the organizations uh, which are part of the international community and urge them to provide assistance to Sudan to ensure that we are able to achieve this food security by developing and uh, investing in the necessary technologies. Madam President, Sudan is especially concerned when it comes to achieving its sustainable development. This is why we have undertaken a number of very significant initiatives aimed at achieving these very important objectives. The delegation of my country yearns to convene a meeting which would enable us to achieve a number of very or hit a number of very important indicators which would enable us to measure progress made when it comes to the implementation of the program of action of 2030 as well as the other major conventions including the paris agreements i thank you madam i thank the minister of labor and administration reform of the sudan for her statement and now give the floor to Her Excellency Mangaliso Kozbitha Ndlovu, Minister of Environment, Climate, Tourism and Hospitality Industry of Zimbabwe. Thank you. Chair, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor and privilege to address this international meeting, Stockholm Plus 50, as the global emergency brought about by the COVID-19 pandemic continues to append our economies and societies. Our efforts to recover and rebuild must go hand in hand with the recognition of the need for a global response to the urgent existential environmental challenges. 
This year marks 50 years since the 1972 Stockholm Conference that contributed to the emergence of a global environmental agenda. Since then, we have agreed and committed to action, notably through the landmark conferences at Rio and Johannesburg, as well as through the adoption of the 2030 Agenda and the Paris Agreement. Unfortunately, science tells us that the enormity of the environmental emergency the planet is facing continues to grow. Implementation of the SDGs is lagging, and the pandemic has caused further severe setbacks. We therefore need to do more, faster, better, and together. Excellencies, at the end of 2021, we gathered to take action on climate change at COP26 in Glasgow. While a number of promising developments and initiatives were adopted, we have to ensure that the most vulnerable will not be further left behind, but can survive the enormous crisis in front of us. As the Secretary General Guterres has noted, and I quote, we are still knocking on the door of climate catastrophe. It is time to go into emergency mode, or our chance of reaching net zero will itself be zero, close quote. Indeed, it is time we all marshal the required political will to bolster climate action and promote the transformative changes we need to realize the objectives of the Paris Agreement. While multilateralism has been at the heart of several environmental success stories since our forebearers met in this beautiful city, over the past five decades, the triple planetary crisis we face today, comprising climate change, biodiversity loss, and pollution, remain an ex existential threat. At the national level, despite the setbacks resulting from the many challenges we face, including unilateral coercive sanctions imposed on our country and the COVID-19 pandemic, Zimbabwe remains fully committed to the success of the critical Rio conventions that address the need for a sustainable use of the environmental resources of Earth. My government values the principles of sustainability and intergenerational equity, which are the cornerstones of our environmental management. We have enacted several acts of parliament that provide for the sustainable management of natural resources. To prepare for this international meeting, my government partnered with UNDP and the embassy of Sweden in Harare, conducted inclusive national consultations, and these were meant to facilitate a whole of society and whole of government ownership through which policymakers, youth, and other stakeholders played a part. Your Excellencies, I want to thank you for this opportunity. I thank the Minister of Environment, Climate, Tourism, and Hospitality Industry of Zimbabwe for his statement, and now give the floor to Her Excellency, Lea Wemalin, Minister of Environment of Denmark. Thank you. Governments should not and cannot make the green transition alone. We need to involve all levels of society, not least the youth. So to all of the young people who are here in Stockholm and who have pushed for global action all over the world, we hear you. And our promise to you coming out of Stockholm Plus 50 has to be that we will do what is necessary to protect our planet, to planet itself, but also to future generation. And who is better than voicing that than a young person himself? So I have brought with me a young delegate from Denmark to speak on our behalf. So Marcus, the floor is yours. Thank you. So thanks to the Danish Minister for Environment, Lea Wermelin, for giving youth and me as a UN youth delegate the possibility to give a statement. This statement is make, taking into account inputs from the green youth movement in Denmark. Because we must recognize the environmental crisis adversely affect health and equality across genders and generations. Therefore, I wish to thank the Stockholm Plus 50 for sharing the vision of meaningful youth participation as the essential for effective and rapid change towards a sustainable and more just future based on the principles of intergenerational inequality. We wish decision makers to remember that 
agreements and action for a sustainable future must be with and by youth, not only for. The threefolded planetary crisis we face sets need for more ambitious and binding agreements. Consequences must be imposed on those countries which do not live up to their obligations. Under the Paris Agreement and the International Agreement under the Convention on Biological Diversity. At the same time, economically resource-rich countries must, to a greater extent, support countries that are seriously affected by the climate change, the biodiversity loss, and pollutions, with help on climate and environmental adaptation. Once again, thanks to the Danish Minister of Environment, Lea Vemlin, for giving the Danish youth the possibility to give a statement here at Stockholm Plus 50. Thank you. I thank the Minister of Environment of Denmark for his statement and now give the floor to Her Excellency Maminata Traore Kulibali, Minister of Environment, Energy, Water and Sanitation of Burkina Faso. Thank you. Madam the Ladies and gentlemen, it's an honor and a genuine pleasure for Burkina Faso to take part in the international meeting Stockholm plus 50 under the theme of a healthy planet for everyone's prosperity, our responsibility, our opportunity, which commemorates the 50 years of global commitment in favor of the environment. Burkina Faso, which is highly vulnerable to the effects of climate change, has chosen to contribute to the global effort to stabilize greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. This commitment has materialized itself through the ratification of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, the Kyoto Protocol, the Paris Agreement, and other multilateral environmental agreements. The country has uh, translated its commitment to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by submitting its nationally determined contribution for the period running from 2021 to 2025. At an operation level, initiatives are being implemented for the benefit of communities to restore degraded land, produce organically through agroecological farms, develop eco-villages, and use renewable energy. Also, in the area of financing environmental actions, Burkina Faso is experimenting with the implementation of the Environmental Intervention Fund. The goal here is to constitute a national office to support the implementation of projects aimed at enhancing adaptation capabilities vis-a-vis uh, -vis the effects of climate change, combating pollution due to plastic waste and chemicals. Ladies and gentlemen, now, by recognizing the importance of multilateralism in the fight against the triple global crisis of the facing the Earth, I'm referring to the climate, nature, and pollution. The Stockholm Plus 50 International Conference aims to act as a springboard. This is why Burkina Faso calls for the implementation of concerted, strong, and inclusive actions which will impact in a positive way the lives of communities. For over and beyond the speeches, it is results that will show our commitment in favor of future generations. Burkina Faso will play its part in this new beginning. Beginning starting here at Stockholm Plus 50, aimed at accelerating the implementation of the UN Decade of Action to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals, uh, including the 2030 Agenda, the Paris Agreement on Climate Change, 
the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. The law regulating the use of plastic packaging and plastic bags will be reviewed to curb plastic pollution. Ladies and gentlemen, by way of conclusion, I should like to extend my congratulations and gratitude to the governments of Sweden and Kenya for having allowed the whole world to come together here at Stock in Stockholm. I thank the Minister of Environment, Energy, Water and Sanitation of Burkina Faso for her statement and now give the floor to His Excellency Robert Eric Boyd, Secretary of the Climate Change Commission of the Philippines. Thank you. Excellencies and partners, let me thank and congratulate our co-hosts Sweden and Kenya and state that the Philippines aligns itself with G77 and China. Fifty years ago, Stockholm was the center of global debate on the environment. Back then, decisions were made, commitments were stressed, actions were pressed to protect the world's environment. Now we are back in Stockholm. It is the best time to ask, have we succeeded? Where have our commitments taken us? Is our world better after we resolved to make it better? The answers are staring at us in the face. The triple threats of biodiversity loss, pollution, and climate change confront us all. Existential threats that leave the Philippines and the developing world very vulnerable and at greater risk. But things have been done. The Philippines' experience has not been easy, but it has been transformative. Our resolve has been tested, but we press on and achieve significant strides to enhance capacities and resiliencies through policies, programs and projects, and promotions. We enacted key environment laws, including our landmark Climate Change Act that institutionalizes mechanisms anchoring climate action as a key element of national development. We benchmark the greening of our governance systems. The OPOSA ruling is the first of its kind in the world, taking intergenerational responsibility as a moral and legal obligation of my government to uphold our people's right to a balanced and healthful ecology. These milestones are concretized through participatory practice, harnessing a whole of society involvement, strengthens the framework for cooperation and capacity building, up to the smallest unit of governance. We empower our localities by devolving resources for fit-for-purpose interventions to climate risks and to enhance transparency and accountability. But while these outcomes are promising, the challenges, including the pandemic and armed conflict, remain complex and complicated. To give our people the environment we deserve, our government remains aware that to survive and thrive, we need to do more. For those who are least responsible for climate change, those with the least resources, and those who are most vulnerable and at risk. Conversely, for those most responsible for climate change, with the most resources, you need to do more. This is climate justice. Let me say this clearly. This should not be a choice, but an obligation. Justice requires us to do more. Our collective moral fiber should be outraged if we cannot deliver climate justice. Our call today, unlock climate finance for the developing world. Unlock it now before it's too late. We don't ask for handouts. We call for urgent, responsible partnerships that deliver results. In this regard, climate finance flow should be demand-driven and responsive to developing and vulnerable countries' needs. It must take a blended approach of grants, investments, and subsidies to ensure local communities can undertake climate action measures, encourage private sector in investment in green projects, and support initiatives leading to transition to climate-resilient economies. Climate finance should be transparent and accessible to implement tangible projects and programs on the ground delivering solutions to the most vulnerable sectors and highly at-risk areas of our societies. Let us go beyond Build Back Better, 
resources are limited. Let us choose instead to build right at first sight, avert disasters, work smart, build assets, anchor policies and programs on universally accessible climate science and technology. Friends, human resolve is needed to move the climate needle in our favor, but are we ready to take the action required of us? It is time for urgent collective action. There's no room for inertia. Let us not fail our planet. Let us not fail our youth and future generations. Let us leave this meeting animated with a greater sense of purpose. And let us redefine our future with results. Thank you. I thank the Secretary of the Climate Change Commission of the Philippines for his statement. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we've had the last speaker in the general debate for this meeting. Before concluding, I would like to remind delegates that Leadership Dialogue 2 on the theme Achieving a Sustainable and Inclusive Recovery from COVID-19 Pandemic will be held tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. in the Victoria Hall. We shall continue hearing statements in the general debate tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. in this plenary hall. The meeting is adjourned.